Viewer discretion is advised. Your fave will be criticized. That's Chris. That's Shan. And welcome to CCTV, the nonstop pop show. And today we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of Australian girl group Bardo. And we have a very special guest. And she is my favorite Bardo member, Belinda Chapel. Bardot is an Australian girl group formed in 1999 on the reality show Pop Stars, the same global phenomenon that went on to create groups such as Eden's Crush, Girls Aloud, and No Angels. The group consisted of Belinda, Tiffany, Sally, Sophie, and Katie. And they are one of the most successful Australian girl groups of all time. They had huge success in Australia and New Zealand, as well as all over Asia in the early 2000s. Um, they have a lot of accolades, but most importantly, they were the first Australian act to ever debut with both a number one single and album in Australia. And the group has actually released their greatest hits on vinyl for the very first time. And we are very lucky today because we are going to go track by track with one of the members. So let's bring in our special guest, Belinda. Hi, Belinda. Thank you for coming on to CCTV. And we are so excited to talk to you about Bardot's greatest hits. So how are you doing? I'm good. I'm a bit over this lockdown at the moment. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's um, can't travel at all. Haven't seen my family in over a year. Mm -hmm. So it's been tough. Oh, it's yeah. understandable. Been keeping me busy and I'm here with my husband in Singapore so we're planning to get to Australia in a few months so yeah oh good for you good it's awesome I, I agree with you with that whole lockdown thing um. <laughs> yeah and I, I feel the same way because I actually grew up in Hong Kong so unfortunately I haven't seen my family either but anyway for me I remember watching pop stars on cable when I was 10 years old and I remember the trip to HMV to buy Bardot's debut album so I've been a huge fan for quite a long time <laughs> but yeah it's been an awesome experience watching this renewed interest in Bardot yeah. for the 20th anniversary. So how has it been for you celebrating it? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I haven't seen the girls, so um, it's sort of just been a little bit of an online thing. And we, well, obviously I'm here and I got, I was actually gonna go actually just before uh, Corona, just before it hit, um, when, it, when it used to be called Corona, now it's COVID, but yeah. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I had a ticket booked and I, and I was literally, it was that week and then it just, everything went into lockdown and um, I was going for work reasons and the work got cancelled and everything because of the, all the studios got closed and everything. So yeah, so that was a pity. I didn't get to go. And at that same time, I think I was going to catch up with the girls and we were going to have a barbecue or a coffee or, you know, just something, a dinner maybe. Yeah. So Obviously not all the girls, but some of the girls, but yeah. Right. So, but we, when we couldn't do that, we just um, were on the phone a lot to each other um, and we started to sing. So that's how those, I don't know if you've seen those videos we did, but yeah, so that's how that. Yes. <laughs> I mean, for me, I mean, I haven't sung in, I literally like, I think I stopped singing like 15 years ago, <gasps> even in the shower, you You're know, so. Oh I literally said that those videos were like me going. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, still there. Me, 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 me. <laughs> 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 no, I totally understand that sentiment. Oh my goodness. Like, you know, with the whole it lockdown. A long, a long time to not sing. Yeah. I mean, I sang jazz for right up until sort of 2005 or six or seven, maybe. Yeah. Gorgeous. So, but still, a long time ago. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. I love jazz, by the way. So you must have an amazing voice, which you do. Um, but yeah, I am, I am the resurgence of fans um, that he was talking about. Like the interest has come in my direction because Chris and I have been watching concerts during this lockdown and he said, oh, I have to show you this group, Pardo. So <laughs> he showed me your, um, the showcase at the end of pop stars and I've, yeah. I've really never even heard of this group until Chris introduced me to you all and I was like wow I really enjoyed watching you like I started watching pop stars and I was like 
oh my gosh. Like, I don't know if it was because of your age or of just your experience, but you were so professional and so level-headed and I had so much respect for you like instantly. So I, my question, <laughs> yeah, of course. So my question for you was, what was it like living with bandmates and forming a bond in such a high pressure situation like that? Uh, it was tough. I mean, I, you know, I was young at the time, 24, I was the oldest in the band. Well, actually, I think we, I don't know if you watched the the series, you watched the series. The whole thing. The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know if my memory is wrong. This is a long time ago, but I'm sure Chantelle lied about her age because, you know, the girl that got yeah. removed. She was always the youngest in the back. She told everyone she was the youngest. And I was always the oldest, right? But actually, now I look behind and she's older than me. So I was the oldest, yeah. It, yeah, in the end, uh, I was the oldest because she left anyway. So, yeah, so I was the oldest in the band. Um, but, yeah, no, it was um, even then, I mean, I was a young 24-year-old, you know. I wasn't right. like you. I'm sure you guys are far more advanced than I was. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> so, in so many ways, mm-hmm. kind of like a late bloomer, I think, quite immature in a way. Um, but uh, not not anymore, but back then maybe. <laughs> but, you know, it was tough. I mean, you know, I had to leave my boyfriend and move in with, you know, girls that I didn't know. Right. And it was interesting because I'd done a lot of travel um, for gigs, for like I'd gone to China singing and dancing on contracts and things like that before Bardo. Mm-hmm. And I'd been on road, lots of road trips around Australia, New Zealand, did we do New Zealand? No, Tasmania and uh, Australia, mm-hmm. um, doing the Tom Jones show. So I impersonated Tina Turner with a wig and, wow. and doing like backing vocals for a Tom Jones impersonator. So I'd been on the road with a lot of girls, a lot of, ta- you know, like I'd, yeah. I knew that oh, hi, nice to meet you on the job, you know, or mm-hmm. at the audition and then you end up sharing a room or, you know. So I was well um, you know, experienced in that side of things, but then it's very different when you've signed on to something that you know doesn't finish in a month or a few months right. and, you know, you move in, you're sharing and you're going on this big sort of journey and it was sort of every every girl's dream to get a record contract, right? That's all they ever wanted. So the pressure, it was just very different. Um, and also I found that the experience was very different because I don't, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm not saying this in a critical way, but I think I was just so used to seasoned dancers and singers mm-hmm. that just turn up and are really professional and really like you get in, you do your job. Like it was it was just a little bit more random and everyone was all yeah. over Australia and it didn't quite have that vibe that I was used to working with other talent. Um, so that was a little bit tough because I was sort of very coming at it from that real entertainment and looking at us as, I mean, it was personal, but it was a product and I was very artistic and I really wanted to sort of contribute, you know, bring in, I brought in Nuno who did all the design for the um, cover, you know, the, the latex and the hot pink yes. and the dog. And, he also created the um, the poison video clip as well um, with, with our input. Like we all, like I designed my disco room and whatever. So we all had our own input with all of that. The image for me was really important. I wanted us to be really. I wanted it to be timeless. I wanted it to be something iconic, and not white je- uh, je- white singlets and jeans. You know. Yeah. So, <laughs> but no, I mean it was. It was and I've gone off onto another tangent, but yeah, no, that your question is, it was tough. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's totally fine. We love tangents. <laughs> it's totally fine. Yeah, it's definitely hard. I think in any situation, like in any group of people, it's going to be, yeah. you know, to suddenly be thrown into some situation where you suddenly have to work together. Yeah. You know, that's always a hard situation. So, and especially you guys were being filmed the whole time too. <laughs> mm, yeah, absolutely. And we were filmed for quite a long time before the show went to air. Um, and then when it went to air and then we were announced, so that took even more time. We had to sort of hide that who was picked, right, over those months of once the show had gone to air. But then, and then again, you know, everything changes once once the fame hits, right? right. Some hmm. more than others, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, so you guys have released 
a vinyl of your greatest hits to celebrate the 20th anniversary. And I know you had a hand in creating the artwork for it. So can you tell us more about the creative process? Yeah, well, no. Well, so I'm an interior designer and I also do creative content, digital content um, for other companies as well. And I also work for other interior design firms. So I keep myself pretty busy. Um, and so when Joe Daddick is a friend of mine, um, and he came to me and said, look, I really want to do this vinyl. And I'm like, right, well, we're going to have to get, we don't own the rights to the music, you know, so um, we're going to have to get that. So we got that and um, we weren't able to do it on a big scale, unfortunately, because of the deal that we were able to get. It had to be very low key for whatever reason. I don't know why. So right. we had to do it only independently. So we did it. And, um, and yeah, and of course, when it comes to design, I was like, right, this is how I want it to look and whatever. And then I have this amazing um, graphic designer that I work with um, who did it for us. And she's a Melbourne base. She's amazing. Yeah, Katie. So, yeah, so I, I've used her before for other stuff. So I went to her and said, can you do this? And she's like, yeah, absolutely, because we're completely on the same page artistically. So, yeah. So Love cool. it. That is really cool. I love the bee yeah. and the the ladies just hanging on them. I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, I've got, I just got sent it um, oh. by FedEx. Yeah, I've got a pink and a blue one. And it is so much more beautiful in real than it is on Pinterest. Yeah. Oh, so. I bet. Sounds gorgeous. But yeah. so, of course, you had to include all of Bardo's singles. But how did you pick some of the album tracks that appear on the package? Uh, that I kind of left to Joe. Um, he had his favourites, you know, he, his sort of investment, you know, so I kind of let him obviously. Uh, oh, and also we can see the st uh, statistics on iTunes and Spotify. So we basically took the, um, the ones that get listened to the most, yeah. Um, and also we had trouble, I think I remember he sent me a track listing and it was... Uh, I think we had 18, so we had more songs, but you can't fit it onto a vinyl. Um, so you've got a limited amount because it, you can put more on, but then the sound quality diminishes. So I had to stick to that many songs and that many only, and then Joe picked those. So, and then, as I said, it was literally done on statistics. So that's how they were picked. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, we are going to get into it and let's go track by track. Don't you treat me bad. Don't you make me sad I'll have to be deep as the ocean If you can't be true I got news for you Just remember I can be poison Poison The first song is Poison, which was Bardo's debut single released in April 2000. And the song is feisty and gritty and is a warning to think twice before being unfaithful. <laughs> and this was written by Daryl Sims and Michael Zumowski, who are members of Australian pop rock band Indecent Obsession. So Belinda, what was your first impression when you heard the track and were you happy that it was the debut single? Uh, <laughs> God. Do you know, the first time I heard it, I was just like, didn't like it, honestly. Like, I wasn't, I wasn't sure at all. I was like, ooh. Um, no, it, it was just, it was, it's an unusual song. I don't know, it's not, it kind of didn't sit with, like, I didn't know where it sat. You know, it kind of, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to say too many negative things, but no, it wasn't my cup of tea, basically. But, uh, and, you know, the demo was decent. It wasn't like some of the demos were, you know, but straight away I'm all about the melody and I can hear what it's going to sound like, you know, um, uh, with us singing on it. So, and then obviously with different production, whatever. But, no, it, the, the demo was fine. It was just, I didn't know. Lyrically, nothing got me. Um, but then when I heard it finished, <laughs> um, and with all the layered vocals and it was I was like yeah and the bass was amazing yeah I think it's a really cool debut single for sure yeah I think so because it's a hard one with the girl band you know it was kind of edgy but not edgy but it was sort of you know people didn't really know where to, you didn't really know where to place that song I don't think yeah like it wasn't a dance pop it was I mean it was obviously pop yeah but it wasn't a dance Track wasn't an RM. I mean, it's a mix between R and B. It's got a bit of everything in it, right? So yeah. yeah. 
I think that's why I personally appreciated it. Like when I first heard it, I, I think I had the same kind of reaction, even though it's not my song. I had the reaction like, what is this, Chris? And, you know, I was like, I don't, I don't know how I feel about it. But then I listened to it some more. And I think it really embodies the attitude of so many women now, like, you know, like pleasure or pain, you pick it but don't make me go there with you. Okay. Like it just fits that yeah. attitude of so many women. Now it's just like, who can play that game, honey. So how was it trying to find the vocal blend for the group when you started recording and then performing live? It was all just so rushed really. I mean, we spent a lot of time in the studio recording the album. That was just a really lengthy process. But one thing that was a little bit, you know, I, I kind of found tough was we didn't spend that much time with a vocal coach or anything kind of finding out where everyone's sweet spots are or anything it was literally just you go in there you sink or you swim like I hadn't recorded much before I'd done a little bit of recording in studios but nothing like nothing like this mm -hmm. um so yeah it was I was only experienced with live vocals so and it's very different singing you know you use a different voice when you when you record oh, yes um, yeah, yeah. I remember finding that quite tough um, and, yeah, and so, no, it was just sink or swim and whatever vocal they liked they used. So, oh, yeah, so you could okay. do everything. And then obviously they knew vocal range. I think Sophie and I had the highest vocal range, so we did a lot of all the high harmonies. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, so, but, uh, but other than that, yeah, it was just in, go in, put it down and see what, you hear it, what yeah. they hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have to, like, from the show, the very first time you all sing Poison together mm -hmm. in the five-part harmony acapella, like, it sounded amazing. Like, I was like, that's that usually takes a long time for a group to, yeah. like, get their blend, right. so. So in that instance, um, we had a vocal coach, I'm pretty sure, or it was, it was the producer that gave us those harmonies, and then we just did it, yeah. So, yeah. But no, I was sitting around... Uh, rehearsing beautifully for hours to get it just right. It was literally just your honey, your honey, your honey. Sing. Okay, good. Now we're filming. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. it was it was good though because I've done some musicals and I've done some background like vocals and it's like to get other people to not be like, oh, it's my moment. Uh, you know, to get them to not sing over each other. So major respect to you, major props to you all for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so for the music video, which I agree, it still holds really well today. Um, was the experience of filming a music video what you expected and and are you happy with the results of it? Yeah, I mean, as I said, look, again, it was so long ago. Um, but I guess I did watch the series not that long ago because it was online. I didn't have, I think I had it on VHS recorded somewhere um, that's, you know, degraded over the years, you know, the tape. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, so whoever put it on YouTube, fantastic, because I watched the whole thing and it was, oh, it was tiring. <laughs> I was like, oh, watching it, some of the parts was just like, what are you doing? Anyway, um, but, you know, there was <laughs> watching yourself 20 years ago, right? It's yeah. weird. But, mm -hmm. but, no, yeah, no, I think the experience was, was good yeah it was good but again it was kind of I mean yes creatively we had some control like as I said I was like I want a catwalk I'm, I'm wearing this I designed that outfit and had it made because I was wow. obsessed, obsessed with uh the D&G campaign with Giselle back then I can remember the hair out I had and she had a disco ball and then I was like, and I'd done a lot of catwalks because I used to model so I was like right I want a catwalk I want disco balls I want you know and I'm wearing this so yeah. I remember that side of it I loved, um, but, you know, it wasn't very long, didn't get to film long. So, yeah, it was, it was boom, next girl, next girl, stressful, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but it would be very different if you were a solo artist and you could, you know, workshop it a bit more. Yeah. Right. The assembly line kind of process of like, get this one girl in, get the next girl out and, you know, yeah. Oh. Yeah. But you, did you have fun though? overall <laughs> yeah oh, definitely yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah with the fan and big hair and woo, yeah oh yeah. yeah you look great you look I was like oh my gosh but um yeah I mean you all seem to have developed your confidence so much more especially with the next song I need somebody
this 70s inspired track was released in October 2001. It's a funky track about finding the perfect lover. It was written by Nigel Butler, Ray Hedges, and John Pickering. Um, I love this song. It definitely just fits into the whole like, you know, pop girl vibe that I just love. And it just fits into my, we can't really go out, but it's for my get ready for filming playlist. So I definitely love this track. It's bright and it's mature and it's dancey. Totally yeah. love it. <laughs> Yeah, I think production wise, it still sounds okay, huh? It's, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah, it's funny. It definitely, especially with the disco resurgence that's kind of coming back now mm -hmm. with Dua Lipa and Kylie's new album, it totally fits with that. Like the production hasn't aged badly at all yeah. and it totally fits in, in, in with all those songs. So yeah. um, were you happy with this track as, as the second single? Yeah, I mean, uh, we were again really busy kind of, the, it was a rush job recording wise. I remember we recorded it uh, in a studio, in a home studio out in the country uh, in the UK. So that was a highlight, definitely. Um, but again, we never really rehearsed it together. We didn't, you know, it was just in and in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you do, we didn't have that beautiful collective recording process, which I know happens and I have had that before after Bardo, but yeah, so I don't even think we went in together ever. We At that stage, we would go in at different times throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So Wow, interesting. Very mm -hmm. interesting. It's, you know, it's interesting that you said that because when I was watching the video, there there is something about, I guess it kind of speaks to your, your ages at the time, but the maturity and the ability to kind of just have like this chemistry on camera. Like it, you guys look so good together, honestly, in that video, you all looked really gorgeous. And I love when you guys are all dancing together. It felt natural. Yeah, that was the recording process, but yeah, the film clip, I mean, yeah, no, we, we all had fun, you know, it was, we did have that chemistry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was evident. Yeah. I totally evident. And um, speaking of, you know, your creative process, um, the group was given more creative control for the second album. So do you think this song was representative of how you wanted the group to evolve? Yes and no. I think, uh, yeah, yes, yes, in ways. Uh, but I mean, with the us, with our artistic control for the second album, I think that was just more, um, I think we still definitely had people behind the scenes and our manager sourcing songs. Um, and then it was, um, I think they wanted to see if we could write. Mm. So then we kind of went off and wrote. And then I think there was eight songs in total or something from everybody. And then they they just picked the, I think four, was it, made the album? Two and, yeah, two and two, four. Yeah. It wasn't like a really well thought out collective kind of um vibe about where we were going with the second album or whatever it, I don't know. I mean, honestly the whole thing was a little bit of a whirlwind so it wasn't like it was like right second album girls let's you know let's have a creative flow about you know what we're going to do and where we want to go and probably if we had have had that we would have disagreed anyway so it's probably best <laughs> us, yeah. I mean it is tough with you know you know, not even just being women, just being people with different opinions and different tastes. So we've also, we loved watching the performances of I Need Somebody, like that dance routine looks really, really fun. Yes. But we also noticed that you added a lot of extra harmonies and ad libs when you guys sang it live. So how was your process arranging your songs for your live performances? Uh, most of the time we just did what we did on the um, song. Uh, and occasionally, depending on if we did it acoustically, we would, yeah, uh, rework the songs, yeah, from memory. Such a long time ago, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we love... We totally love this song we were just like oh yeah this is great we were dancing to it and I have a like, super random question but when I was watching this show um the the talks about what the group would be named kept coming up and I kept hearing you say kismet kismet I kismet you know or something like that <laughs> so what were you, what was what was a um a name that you had considered that you really liked 
And how do you think, how do you feel about Bardo as a group name now? No, look, I, from memory, I'm pretty sure it was all Sophie and I that came up with that. I remember I wanted it to be the last name of someone really amazing from the past, like a beautiful, iconic woman. And I said Hepburn, let's call it Hepburn. And then I think everyone kind of agreed on that and then they searched for it, but there was another Hepburn, a band in America, I think, like a rock band or something. So that was out of the question. And then Sophie's like, what about Bridget Bardo? That's her favourite. And mine was Audrey Hepburn. So, and I was like, I love Bardo. Bardo's brilliant because straight away I could see so uh, what you could do with a B, you can do so much, yeah. um, you know, with a B to make logos and that kind of thing. B is such a great letter. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> yeah, not that indeed. It, yeah. um, so I was like, that's ultra cool. And then the girls, I don't know, I was all for it. Um, and then I think some people were into it, but it just ended up one of those ones where everyone kind of went, okay, you know? Uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay, well, so the third track on The Greatest Hits is Down, which is a sweet, sparkling album track from the first album, and it was done by Nick Howard. I think this could have totally been the fourth single from the album. It's bright and happy, and it does kind of show the group in a different vibe from kind of the more edgy stuff that you released as, as singles. So do you have any thoughts on this track or any memories about it? I think it's just one of those odd tracks. Like the words are like, I'm down, but yet it's the happiest sounding, like I'm in a car, put the wind down, windows down. You know, it's that total, like, I don't know. It's yes. like all just yes. a car. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying I'm down, you know what I mean? So that song always confused me, but I still think it's that song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I agree. It's one of those, like, the lyrics are deceptively, like, mm. the, the, the melody of everything is, like, deceptively happy, but the lyrics are, like, miserable or something. Uh, but, um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I found this song to be very interesting because you have Poison in these days that lean toward edgier kind of um, energies and more darker concepts so this song was a little bit more bubblegum did it fit with your idea of Bardo's sound when you first started putting the album together well I don't know I mean I think there's quite a few eclectic it's an eclectic album like you know if you look at all we've got like a bit of gospel a bit of country it's all happening <laughs> so I don't know I don't, didn't really think I thought yeah whack that in I don't know it didn't really yeah to me yeah again all, all very different songs on that album. So I think definitely Play It Like That was a little bit more um, uh, kind of like a vibe, you know, mm -hmm. overall. Right, yeah, right. But speaking of the gospel track, uh, the fourth track on the album is Higher Than Heaven. Um, it was originally by Kalei Bryan, and this is a gospel-inspired song, and it's a joyful celebration of a loved one's support. Um, this song... It, to be honest with you, when I heard it, I was thinking like, oh, are they doing the harmonies as well? Because I listened to the original um, a little bit after and I was really impressed with how you ladies use your own voices to create the harmonies instead of using a choir or additional outside voices. Oh that was, yeah, that was us, uh, like doing every single harmony in there. Remember <laughs> all the high ones just going, are you joking up there? Right? <laughs> Yeah, and then the little low ones as well, really low ones. But no, that sounds great. I love Higher Than Heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. It's it's definitely one of my favorites. And and good job, because, yeah, the backing vocals are really beautiful. It's, it makes it sound so full. Um, and, yeah. and you guys did perform it a lot as well, <laughs> which is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's great. It's I mean, I'm a, I love gospel music, so, you know, oh, it's beautiful. Like, absolutely beautiful. Do you do you have any kind of uh like a favorite memory from an appearance singing the song? You know, not not really, but um someone sent me a live recording of a concert. Mm -hmm. Um and that was our first national tour and I think that, and we had really amazing musicians on that tour. We had like the best drummer and, and just the, it was just, yeah, to listen to it, I just got goosebumps, like the, the, the screaming of the fans and then just the beautiful, I mean, yeah, the drums and the bass player and no, it was my 
really, really cool lie. We were, like, very lucky uh, for our first tour. Um, and, yeah, so that would be just listening to that was like, wow, we really had it. I mean, I think also I think I was surprised at how good we sounded for our first first ever tour, you know, with not much rehearsal. As I said, everything was rushed. <laughs> um, and... Uh, yeah, not much rehearsal, I think, considering, and as you say, we hadn't sung together before, you know, it was, and I look back and I go, wow, we really did have something special. I think all our different voices, Katie's voice was so different, mine was different, everyone's tone, Sophie had such a beautiful voice, and Tiffany, like, velvet, you know, so, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it was, it was special times, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, the second single that you released from the first album was I Should Have Never Let You Go. And this was a mid-tempo soulful song, which is about the regret one feels after breaking up with a former lover. And again, the harmonies in this are amazing. I love I love the vocal stacking of the octaves and like the whispers that come in. Yeah. Um, it's just a really, really cool track. Mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> I remember hearing the song and I thought of um, Brandy sitting up in my room. When I first heard it, I was like, oh, shut up. I'm like, wait, 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 Chris, is this, what song is this? So yeah, um, <laughs> did you agree with this track being chosen as a second single? Yeah, I mean, I, yes and no. It, was, it wasn't my favorite. Um, but it was a good vibe, you know? Wow. Yeah. And it's so different to anything else on the album. Again, as I said, a very eclectic album. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, so this track was done by an American producer, and we've talked in the past that we have we feel that Americans, for some reason, they <laughs> like to choose one lead vocalist in a group. And in this case, Katie pretty much sings lead on the whole track. And yeah. the rest of the album, it's more spread out. So how was the vocal distribution decided when you recorded with the group? And, and was it ever a cause of drama? Um, I remember being pretty disappointed most tracks. I mean, you know, it's, again, it was just, there was absolutely no, um, uh, as I said, we didn't ever workshop it. We didn't ever sit around and go, you sound good singing this, you sound good, you know, which we really kind of should have done, I think. Um, but as I said, it was with that was Tommy Farragher, I think, that did that uh, the vocals for that track, and I think he just kind of gave everybody their sweet stop spot moments. I think with most of his tracks, um, so I don't wouldn't really say he had his particular favorite because he did these days, he did um, a few others on the album. So, yeah, but I think it was just Katie's sweet spot. She was, you know, nailing it. So she got most of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Understandable. So in this video, you actually got to become an animated character and a superhero. So what was the vision for your character? Oh, well, they just, um, they basically, I had that cat suit that I used to wear on stage. So they just drew that, like they put that on me and that, and I used to wear stars on my head, stick them on and a uh, bit of, bit of uh, crimping going on. That was in back then, by the way, very in. Uh, and yeah, and so they just, they just basically took me, what I look like on stage in one outfit. And then, and I always had blue eyeshadow because I remember in the cartoon, I've got the really blue. Um, yeah, so they did that. And then I think we got to, like, design our um, mode of transport. So I, I wanted a red Vespa without wheels and then I had disco ball nunchuckers. So, yeah, but that was cool. The sixth track on this album is Missing Your Love by Darren and Dennis Dowlett. And it's a guitar-driven ballad about an ill-fated love from the first album. So do you have any memories about recording the song? Yeah, so basically what happened, I'll just fill you in on the, we were given, I remember, and unless I dreamt this, because it is 20 years ago, but I'm, I'm certain we were given a Franklin's, which is a supermarket plastic bag, with a whole lot of cassettes, like 100 cassettes. And we were in a room in the studio and we went through them and then we put the top 10 aside. 
And let me tell you, it was pretty easy. Like, it was like, no, no, no. Like, there was some very, very, uh, from memory, just interesting songs in that little Franklin's bag. Um, So these were, like, the only ones that were even remotely possible, from memory, that we could even consider, right? (laughs) Um, And then with the Kaylin songs, I don't know if they came in later or they were in that Franklin's bag, I can't tell you. But, um, yeah, no, great tracks. Love, yeah, love them both, yeah. So do you prefer singing, like, the ballads or do you prefer singing more up-tempo tracks? Back then I was all about up-tempo. Back then I didn't even know how to sing a ballad, you know, because I was a dancer more than a singer and so I was always like, I don't want to be Michael Jackson. I don't want to. Oh, same. <laughs> sit there and do Mariah I want to do Michael um so that was my vibe then but now I would sing ballads more probably yeah it's definitely nice to hear you all use just a different more emotional part of your voice in in ballads though and this one definitely is a beautiful one um so the next song on the compilation is These Days which is done by Colin Campsey, Phil Thornley and the Rock Melons and this was your third and final single from the debut album And it is a dark electronic rock hybrid track. And it has some really cool synths in it. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a highlight for me. And it's very memorable just upon the first listen. So were you happy with this as the third single from the album? Definitely. I think I'm pretty sure that's my favorite track in a way on the album. I mean, I'm, as I said, I love R&B and, and uh, I love disco and I love uh gospel but I think that this is the strongest track on the album I think um for so many different reasons I think if you had to pick like one song that is the best song for as I said so many different reasons I think these days is the one yeah I can understand that completely I think um what was interesting for me was like the juxtaposition for like the alternative sound and the the guitar riffs, the carefreeness of how everything sounded. Uh, Because when I first heard it, I was a little bit like, I love darker kind of sounds. I love love like Nine Inch Nails kind of grit kind of thing like that. So when I heard it, I was like, oh, this is right up my alley. And then I hear guitars and I was like, okay, hang on, wait. (laughs) So uh, I've come to really enjoy this song. And um, I also noticed that the lyrics became abstract in your second verse. Yeah, lyrically, it's the cleverest on the album as well. But um, and I love a good lyric in a song, so I think that's one of the reasons why it would, could be one of the best songs. Um, and then I think there's something really beautiful about the rock sound with kind of these um, in ways dark feminine vocals, but also um, kind of naive sounding vocals. You know, mm-hmm. feminine. Soft, like it, so there's that beautiful contrast, yeah, yeah, agreed. Oh, so speaking of the lyrical content, my question for you is What are the two, three, four letter words that you <laughs> mentioned? Because when I heard that lyric, I don't know, you don't know. <laughs> the F word, isn't it, or head or something? I don't know, because I was like. I was, I was listening. I was like, I like these lyrics, you know, you know, I don't know if I into the swimming pool. And then we get to the two, three, four letter words. And I, <laughs> I was just like, whoa, wait, <laughs> but it's still a great song. Nonetheless. What about it? Isn't that funny? I'm pretty sure it's, it's, it's a swear, a four letter swear word, right? I don't know. Uh, that's a naive. I'm yeah. the, I'm the naive guitar riff <laughs> over here. So, okay. Makes sense now. <laughs> This is a this is a cool music video. You guys are like on the beach at night. Um, what do you have any fun memories from filming this one? Oh, I just remember being really annoyed because I it was like my verse and I was so excited to do. I didn't get any um, verses on any of the other singles, mm. and they ran out of light, and you can't even see me. <gasps> oh no! <laughs> well, <laughs> well, your silhouette is gorgeous, honey. It's gorgeous. I was on, yeah, my silhouette. Yeah, and you know, Kate, I was looking at it 
the other day because we were we we did this unpacking of our video clips for um, pedestrian TV the other day, and I was watching it, um, and I was just like, oh my god, it's um it's hysterical. Like it's literally like I remember they're going, oh, it might be a bit because my scene was on the balcony, right? Yeah. And they wanted it a little bit moody, but I don't think they wanted it that moody. And uh, and I just remember going, oh my god, it's like I'm you won't, it could be anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I mean, your hair was blowing in the wind. I mean, could be anyone there. But anyway, that's me singing two, three, four letter word. <laughs> um, your look uh, for the arias. I remember telling Chris, I said, oh, these days there's a performance. She's wearing the short skirt in her hair. And then we watched it together and he, the performance was interesting. Did you feel pressure performing there? And how was the creative preparation? I just remember being so tired. We were, I was exhausted that day. I remember, yeah, because we were doing so much. And usually, you know, if you're a normal artist, you've got, right, the arias are coming up. And then you spend weeks rehearsing, right? Mm -hmm. You do test runs, what you're wearing, everything, you know, like it's, I know that's what happens, you know. <laughs> And uh, we were again also rushed. You know, we had a bit of a rehearsal, and uh, we had—I remember—we had a really big week doing other lots of other stuff. So by the time we got to that, and plus we were flying out really early the next morning to Singapore. So I remember just being exhausted, you know, all round. But um, no, that was um, intense, and I remember being really nervous, really, really nervous. Yeah, and we haven't had that experience live at that point so it was we got better I think later on yeah the eighth track on the album is Dirty Water which is an angsty and raw uh, song it's an alternative cut from the second album and is about ending a friendship after being screwed over basically um, so it's a cover of a song by a group called Made in London a multinational girl group from the early 2000s yeah I remember very clearly a friend like stole something from my locker or something stupid like that. And I remember playing this song and singing along very angrily <laughs> <laughs> and just getting my anger out in my room so that I have good memories of this song. Um, do you, what, what are your thoughts on this song? Right up my alley. It was a bit straight away for me. It was Janet. It was Janet, Janet, Janet. Like, I'm Janet right now recording this. So I remember loving it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> What a yeah. what an awesome like like idea to have about it because when I heard it, um, I also heard like it kept, the production just reminded me of Love Spits Love rendition rendition of um, How Soon Is Now. So it has like have you ever seen Charmed at all? No. no. Oh, okay. Well, it just has the same kind of like uh, alternative like guitar sound. So I instantly liked it. Like the part of me is like a little bit of a rock girl, R and B rock girl. So this song, yeah. the production, I was just like sucked in, um, for yeah. sure, for sure. Uh, Janet track, um, one of my favorite Janet tracks. If I were only, if I don't tell you, um, <gasps> Chris loves if. this song. If that's yes. my favorite Janet Chris song. Loves <laughs> if yes. <laughs> it's totally that. It's mm -hmm. that whole, it's that whole era. Like yeah, great track. All right, well, so the ninth track is definitely a highlight. It is Don't Call Me, I'll Call You, oh. which is a sassy pop R&B track, which tells an ex to back off and never come back. And it was written by you and Michael Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> I love a sassy girl power moment for every girl group, and this totally delivers. And I definitely think it could have been a fourth single had you guys done one. So I wrote, uh, he did all the music and I did all the melodies and lyrics. So that's all me. <laughs> wow wow yeah and he, he was great he was very much into that sound and again I told you I was channeling in my own head Michael Jackson at the time so and a bit of Janet so for me it was just all about a really good dance break um and and quite staccato um and then we do the in the round which I think is really clever I don't know mm -hmm. you know in the round singing where mm -hmm. you start yes the other we yeah. love that the overlapping yeah. we love that whole we yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, love it that was cool. um and then uh yeah i think vocally i listen to it now and i hate it like i, I want to do it like it's so bad like there's some 
four moments on it. Um, but uh, but no, I mean it's a uh, it's interesting that you like it because um, the manager, our manager at the time, came to us and said uh, we want it to be the third single, but one of the girls refused to do it because I wrote it. Yeah. So. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, well, you know, <laughs> but no, since you did write it though, but since you did write it, I wanted to just say like the song gave me dark child feels. So the whole Destiny's Child vibe that you were feeling or whatever you were go- thinking about when you were writing it, it was definitely translated into the song. Um, yeah. The bridge, the dance break, like you said, with the kick it, uh, check this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did you have writing experience prior um, to your time in Bardot? Uh a little bit mm-hmm. I think um I'm trying to remember I know because I've got so many demos of songs that I've written like so many but uh I I know there was like seven around the Bardot time that I that I wrote that I've got I've still got now um so I don't know I I'd had a little bit but not a lot yeah mm-hmm. I definitely wrote a lot more after Bardot yeah well, for this, for the second album, which this song didn't make it onto the great, onto this final, but you also co-wrote the track Girls of the Night. And I love that one too. So what was the influence for that track? Well, that was again, so um, I think uh, uh, Michael Darcy had the, uh, I'm trying to know, I think we actually came up with the, Melody of the song, we wanted to write a song about a girl's night out and Tiff and I did that together. So I brought Tiff in to work with Michael because I'd already worked with Michael and I thought this could work. So I said, Tiff, do you want to come and write a song with me? So she came and we went in and um, and we both decided, yeah, we wanted like a fun party, girls getting ready, girls night out track. That's how it came about. And then, yeah, so we wrote the lyrics and Michael did the music and, yeah, a bit of fun. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, it's so nice to find like have like chemistry, like writing chemistry with someone. Cause sometimes you could be put in a situation where things aren't clicking. So I really do love that the chemistry that you and Tiffany had was translated into yeah. as oh, as that. That's lovely. Yeah, yeah. We were good friends, very good friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you were mentioning that you do have some demos um that kind of I guess, spawned after your time in Bardot. What have you done with them? Are you just leaving them on your computer? Or (laughs) what are you doing with them? (laughs) Some of them will never be heard by anyone. (laughs) Um, Some, I think, are on YouTube. I think they got, I think the people that I wrote uh, them with have put them on YouTube. Um, There's quite a few, I think, on YouTube, just randomly by different people, yeah, have popped them up. Awesome. Well, this song never got a music video, I guess, because, you know, the other girl didn't let you. But uh, if you got to direct a music video, what would your vision be for it? Oh, back then, I don't know. But now, I no, actually, no, even after, but I, no, I'm really into Maloko um, and uh, Rosa Murphy. So I would kind of go down that kind of road um, for a film clip. Avant-garde, high fashion. Big hair, uh, yeah, definitely. I, I think um, that's my favourite part of the whole process when being involved in the creative side, yeah. That's awesome that you kind of had this eye from the beginning, so it's very impressive. I definitely respect that about you for sure. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So the 10th track on the album is Love Will Find A Way. It is breezy and hopeful, and this pop rock song served as the last single from the group. It was written by Ollie J, Philip Jacobs, Patrick M- McCann, McMahon, McMahon, McMahon. No, don't I don't know. And Mickey Moore. There's a lot of names, you know. And <laughs> but speaking of a lot of names, this this song just gave me like high school sweetheart vibes, or you know, just time with your friends. You're just looking back. If I had like a little slideshow. I would definitely put the song on it. It's very just, yeah. it's, it's easy. I love easy going songs like this and it has like a little bit of a country twang to it. So I really appreciate it. How do you feel about the track? Yeah, it's a solid song. It's beautiful. And again, and lots of beautiful harmonies, layered vocals that we did, all the oohs and the ahs and the, uh, and Tiffany did a beautiful job in the vocal 
Absolutely. I don't even remember singing, recording it at all. I, I don't at all, but I just, yeah, I, I don't even know where. I think it was in London, I think, maybe. I'm not sure. When you were promoting the track, you guys often performed it acoustically. So what made you decide to do that? Uh, I think we always did that with a lot of the tracks. Um, it's just, it's easier, right? It's so hard to sing and dance, for one. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then it's just so nice, just a, a beautiful change, you know, and you've got four vocals, uh, four vocalists that you can do beautiful harmonies and they just come across better if you're acoustic, right? I, I think definitely harmonies just really sing when it's acoustic, yeah. For sure, for sure. It sounded great. Um, I enjoyed watching the video for the track. I mean, <laughs> the video clip was quite nice. You know, with the whole cowboy aesthetic and the men. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was your what was the idea behind the video? And did you get to help cast those young men? I'm pretty sure it was me that came up with that whole concept of being in the country and having like a love story. Like I, I, I do remember putting it to everybody and then they took it and put it into, you know, we went to Goulburn and filmed it and it was wow. great. And then, yeah, everyone had to pick. We had, we, I think I'm pretty sure again, 20 years ago, we had um, comp cards of models and we got to pick out. <laughs> yes, um, comp cards. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, so the 11th track on this compilation was Before I Let You Go, which is a heartbreaking R&B inspired track written by Darren and Dennis Dowlett and Richard Goncalves. And this is another really beautiful ballad, some amazing harmonies and, and the blend is, is so good in this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. It's, um, yeah, very much that time, uh, you know, music what was on trend um, and, uh, yeah, great R and B track. It's cool. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I felt the slow jam. I felt the slow jam energy completely. I was like, oh yeah, this is nice. It actually, um, when I heard the chorus of the song, it reminded me of another ballad by the same name by Blackstreet. Yeah. So when I heard it, I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Okay, this is what I'm feeling. This is the the little '90s vibe that I'm feeling from this. Um, do you have any memories recording this track? No, I, I think again rushed in and out, um, and then obviously with uh, Darren and Dennis, uh, who were so talented, lovely, lovely guys. Um, yeah, that that's about it. <laughs> so the final track on the greatest hits vinyl is ASAP. This was the first single from the second album, and it was written by Henrik Jonback, John McLaughlin, and Frederick Odessio. Why do I get the hard names? <laughs> it's a fast tempo track about the meddling mother of a significant other. And I must say, the song was a little surprising to listen to at first, you know, <laughs> first listen, because the subject matter, although familiar to me, was a little unexpected. <laughs> so... What were your initial thoughts about this song? Yeah, I've had your mamas in my business too. So yeah, the, the I've had that experience when I was really young. Yeah, my first my first boyfriend. That absolutely happened. So I could definitely relate to the lyrics, but no, it's my least favorite song. But I love the dance and the film clip. I love. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So how do you? <laughs> I mean, I like the um the bridge part. The harmonies are really cool and just really sleek. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the song and the lyrics just for me, it's a no. The lyrics are, you know, not the best, not the best. But I can appreciate the 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 vocals. I'll say that. <laughs> so this was the first single you released without Katie. So how was it rearranging the older songs without her and, and how did it affect your vocal blend as a group when she left? Yeah, I mean, I I love, I absolutely adore Katie's voice. I think she's probably my favourite vocalist out, out of all the girls and everyone's great. But I think mm. Katie, for me, I think it's just she, she's got such a wonderful tone. It's so eclectic. Um, and But no, I mean, again, we it was sort of rushed everything to me everything was rushed it wasn't like we sat down and again right. and 
collectively went through, okay, let's, you know, let's really bring out everyone's vocals to their best abilities in this album and let's really work together. And there was none of that. It was, you know, and it's, again, like each each track on the second album uh, and ASP, ASP is obviously on the second album was recorded with different producers. So it was literally just you meet the producer on the day. They'd never heard you sing before. You just go in and go, they go sing it and that's it. And then you're out. Wow. Yeah. It's a little impersonal, just a wee bit. Oh, well. <laughs> just a little impersonal, you know. <laughs> Do you have any memories from the video shoot? I remember, yeah, I, I remember it was in Melbourne. We filmed it in Melbourne and I loved going to Melbourne. Um, and, yeah, just uh, my, the choreographer um, was my friend that I brought in, Michael, um, and Michael Boyd, he's a, a wonderful choreographer. And and then my friend Nuno was in the sh- in it too. So the two lead dancers, my friends that I'd known long before Bardo. So I, that was really cool, awesome to have them. Yeah, That's awesome for sure. I mean, your your image for this um, project was definitely different from the first album cycle. So it was yeah. well sexy. It was nice. I liked the looks mm-hmm. and everything. You know, the confidence was definitely there. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, that actually concludes the greatest hit sequence. How has it been for you, like listening to these old songs again? And, and do you have an ultimate favorite song now? I haven't listened to them much, to be honest. Uh, and I haven't even, I haven't got a vinyl player, so I haven't actually put the, um, the vinyl on yet. Um, and yeah, I've been really busy the last year and this year, so I haven't, no, I haven't listened to it much. I did listen to the whole album once and I just remember loving loving the harmonies, the thick, how many, the layers of harmonies and how cool our blend sounded. Um, but song-wise, probably higher than heaven. I don't know, it always gets me, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Chris, do you have an ultimate Bardo song? <laughs> Oh, that's so hard. I think I will go, I need somebody. I think it's so good. And I think it's aged. It's just aged really, really well. Definitely. I wanted that one. Oh, but I will select these days because that two, three, four letter word will live <laughs> in my heart forever, ever, <laughs> for absolute ever. But speaking of what you've been doing this whole past year, you live in Singapore now and you've established your own interior design company, as you've mentioned. So could you tell us a little bit more about your life now? My life now is uh, very, very different to what it was. Yeah, it's. I kind of, yeah, it's, I live in an adult world these days. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yes. uh, and, and very normal, you know, I have a very normal life. I, I um, meditate a lot. I do a lot of yoga um, oh, wow. and I work and I have a beautiful Swedish husband um, that, and we met each other here in Singapore. Oh, and very, very happily married. We don't have children, unfortunately, not yet. But yeah, my life is good. I'm very content. Yeah. We've loved the acoustic videos that you, Tiffany, and Katie had done. So do you yeah. have any more plans to do more of that or anything else to, to continue the celebration? No, it was just a one-off. Honestly, we were all in lockdown at that time. So I was in lockdown. So work was... Um, was from home you know I was just at home um and uh Katie was the same she was in in a harsh lockdown at that time Tiffany wasn't um but she's got six kids you know and it's very complicated and no nothing nothing is happening yeah (laughs) that is fine we'll take our little our little nuggets of you know we'll take it (laughs) it sounded great it sounded great we'll take our little nuggets of you three you three are my favorite you three are my favorite (laughs) But seriously, though, thank you so much for joining us here on CCTV today. Um, It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and learning about your experiences in such a legendary girl group. Um, Do you have any last thoughts you'd like to share with your fans? (laughs) With fans? Uh, No, not really. (laughs) Pretty. uh, But no, I just wanted to say you guys are great. And thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. My my 10-year-old self is very excited that I just had this conversation with you.
All right. Well, the limited edition Bardo Greatest Hits vinyl in hot pink and blue are available at goatnation.com.au. And you can check out Belinda on Instagram at Belinda Chapel. So let us know what you guys all think about Bardo and their greatest hits. Please give us a like, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell because we have more special guests coming up. So who knows who will be next? <laughs> um, and don't forget to follow us at CCTV Pops on all our social media. And until next time, that's Shan. That's Chris. And we are CCTV. Bye. Bye.